There's nothing in the world quite like Rodeo Drive. I'm Bronwyn Cosgrave. Hello, and welcome to Rodeo Drive, the podcast. High fashion has always been a feast for the eyes. Now it's also tickling your taste buds. The world's finest luxury brands are venturing into food. We always try to get some inspiration from uh, Gucci too. Like, uh, for example, when you sit at our table, the first things that you see is uh, uh, the Gucci bee that you receive. It's a butter, it's a bee butter. We'll meet the man whose culinary journey has taken him from the mountains of Italy to Beverly Hills. That's Mattia Agazzi. He's head chef at Gucci Osteria da Massimo Bottura on Rodeo Drive. And we'll hear from a famed fashion designer who has just opened a family restaurant, Umberto Leon. Fashion is all about storytelling. And I think storytelling in food, I think those are big commonalities. Armani, Fendi, Gucci, Prada, Ralph Lauren. The top brands often serve food to VIPs at their fashion shows, even during the pandemic. But now some of the world's finest chefs are collaborating with designers and brands to open restaurants and launch gastronomy ventures. You could call it an entree into the brand at a democratic price point. That's according to Kathy Gohari. She's president of the Rodeo Drive Committee, and she's been watching the food and high fashion fusion trend. I think it's a very smart segue in giving access to people to their brand at a very different level, tapping in into a brand new market and engaging a much wider audience that not necessarily would buy their fashion product, but is a huge fan of their restaurant or their food or their coffee shop. You know, you get the world of experience, they bring in their heritage, their legacy, and their identity, and they blend it with the local community. Why would a world-class chef want to collaborate with an A-list luxury brand like Gucci? Same exact uh, reason why Gucci would want to collaborate with them, engaging a wider audience. The chef that partners up with Gucci, all of a sudden, the entire world knows about him. (laughs) And they are opening a whole new audience um, that is attached to the brand that Otherwise, they would have no access to. Kathy Gohari is president of the Rodeo Drive Committee. In 1995, Massimo Botora and his wife, Laura Gilmore, launched Osteria Franciscana in Modena, Italy. Its inventive menu melded their love of art with Italian cooking based on ingredients foraged close to home. A few years ago, Botura forged an alliance with another Italian institution, Gucci. So what sort of magic is possible when a Michelin-starred chef is charged with distilling on a plate the essence of a world-class brand? You experience it at a Michelin-starred restaurant named Gucci Osteria da Massimo Botura in Florence. Botura with chef Karima Lopez created artful dishes based on cross-cultural cooking. Last year, the second Gucci Osteria de Massimo Botura opened in Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive. Stepping inside, I felt like I was entering Gucci's universe. The velvet lining the banquettes is the plushest and a delicious color of cherry red. The kitchen is a jewel box fashioned from stainless steel. We have the main course kitchen here with uh, Matthew. And uh, then we have uh, uh, the bread section there Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Tamara and they're working on it. And then we have uh, the pasta section. This is Chef Mattia Agazzi. I met up with him at Gucci Osteria. Mattia was raised in Bergamo, a beautiful town found in the foothills of the Italian Alps. Like many chefs, he grew up watching his mother and grandmother cook. So um, basically, since I was uh, 11, it's always been my dream to be a chef. And uh, my 
grandmother, she will used to uh, prepare everything. And, uh, Fresh. Them. Yes, it will be always one of my best memories. From there, he went on to cooking school. Then he went to work at top restaurants in London, Paris, and Sydney. He was about to board a plane for another position in Singapore. But then he got a call from Massimo Botora. And uh, of course, I missed the flight that day. <laughs> but uh, when like Massimo calling, I feel like four, four chefs. It's for like any the Pope. Chef, yes, it's like the Pope, <laughs> exactly. So uh, I wasn't able to say, no, I'm leaving. <laughs> Ultimately, Mattia landed at Gucci Osteria in Florence. After two years, he moved to Los Angeles for the role of chef de cuisine at the second restaurant in the partnership between Gucci and Massimo Botora. It was his first trip to the U.S. I felt like I was in a movie. All the lights, and uh, I arrived here. It was nighttime, so like it was, uh, yeah, I was very excited about the new experience that was coming up. So yeah. tell us how this restaurant is different, Gucci Osteria Beverly Hills to Gucci Osteria Florence, or maybe another one that is soon to open. Yeah, basically, let's start to say that uh, the interior design is completely different. Of course, the menu. What's happening in Florence is a Karime that uh, twisting the Mexican culture with Italian ingredients. And what's happening here is like uh, um, the Italian kitchen with uh, twisted with uh, uh, local ingredients. The dishes on the menu play to a fashionista's love of color and texture, as well as a foodie's appreciation for great cooking with local ingredients. It's Instagram heaven. There's Uni Carbonara, a whirl of bright green spaghetti with a twist of orange Santa Barbara uni atop, and a risotto camouflaged as pizza with cherry tomato sauce, cream, stracciatella, and powdered burnt capers that evoke a pizza crust. Some of the dishes have playful names like Oops, I Broke the Meringue. That's a cracked disc of thin meringue with a raspberry-colored design of leaves and flowers that echo the Richard Genori dinnerware on which it's plated. And there's a trout dish called Coming from the Hills, I Love Rock Climbing. It's an homage to Agassi's childhood fishing trips with his grandfather. Then there's the crispy veal sandwich. It's very nice. It's a a surprise, but uh, there is a smile on the cracker. So we think like, we thought that was like after uh, this year of uh, uh, pandemic and uh, we went through, we thought it was the best way to bring a smile was with a sandwich that has the shape of a smile. So it's like kind of funny when you receive it at the table too. I look forward to tasting it. How does Gucci Osteria connect to the essence of Gucci? So how does the cuisine maybe connect to what you see on the runway or the red carpet? Uh, I would say is that uh, we always try to get some inspiration from uh, Gucci too. Like, uh, for example, when you sit at our table, the first things that you see is uh, uh, the Gucci bee that you receive. It's a butter, is a bee butter. Or like uh, our Ginori China that we're using here and uh, from Florence. And uh, Tamara, she created this uh, uh, dessert that matched perfectly with uh, the Gucci style. Yeah. So tell us about living in Los Angeles and working in Beverly Hills. It's far away from where you were born in Bergamo. Yeah, uh, it's far away, but um, I always feel as if I'm home. Um, first of all, because of the ingredients that I found here mm. are very similar and are very uh, focused on uh, the farmers and uh, especially like the farmers market is something that reminds me of course uh, uh, Italy and then again there is like these vibes of healthiness and uh, spore that uh, surrounded all the city and uh, the nature that is where usually uh, I spent my day off so like I really feel like I'm as if I'm home. Tell us about the challenges of the pandemic, Mattia. How did you, what was your experience and how did it maybe change Um, your approach? Maybe for me personally, the biggest challenge for me as Italian 
It's like that now we can't hug people anymore, for example. <laughs> but um, aside of that, that of course has been a, a very tough period for uh, everyone. Uh, I would say that for us it's been a kind of uh, important because we build and we uh, get stronger as team. Basically what we did, we uh, collaborated with the Hollywood Food Coalition and we serve almost 10,000 meals uh, during the pandemic for um, people indeed. And uh, what Massimo always teaches to us to uh, use our uh, ability and skills, not just for uh, doing it as job, but as passion. And that's what like one more time we demonstrate to, mm. uh, to the people, yeah. Rodeo Drive. Why do you like working on Rodeo Drive? Or explain the atmosphere and how it inspires you. Well, Rodeo Drive, I would say we are in the um, main street of Los Angeles. And that's for sure is like kind of a big achievement for all of us. That's Mattia Agazzi. He's head chef at Gucci Osteria da Massimo Botora, Beverly Hills. As we've heard, artful food is an accessible way to explore a fashion house. But a fashion designer's eye can also bring a new sensibility to a restaurant. Take Umberto Leon. With Carol Lim, he co-founded Opening Ceremony back in 2002. Together, they went on to be creative directors of the iconic Paris label Kenzo. Now, Leon has gone back to his roots, working with his mother, his sister, and his brother-in-law to open Chifa. The cuisine at Chifa is Peruvian Chinese with an artful twist of Taiwanese fare. Chifa is in the neighborhood where he grew up, but Umberto Leon watchers expect this won't be the only location for a restaurant design to wow the eye and excite the taste buds. I asked Umberto to explain what happens when the worlds of food and fashion collide. I think that fashion is all about storytelling. And I think storytelling in food, I think those are big commonalities. I think um, thinking about the aesthetics of the food is something that growing up with my family, you know, my mom always says you eat with your eyes first. And I think that's really true. So I think that food is, is very aesthetic and there's stories, but I think you can't hit home unless it tastes amazing. So I think that's the winning formula that's different than fashion. I also feel like food is democratic because you like the food or you don't. It's not like fashion where it could be polarizing because you don't want to look a certain way or you think things are too short or too long or too this. I wouldn't wear colors like that. When you talk about, you know, being democratic, I feel like food is very democratic and, and can be because it's all about a feeling. Mm -hmm. It kind of speaks louder than fashion, maybe? Yeah, I think it reaches more people. Mm. It allows for more people to be a part of the conversation. For him, that conversation takes place at Chifa, and it comes with a great story, starting with the name. Chifa is a word, he says, that Peruvians use to refer to all Chinese restaurants. The term actually comes from the Mandarin term, chifan, which you say when you're trying to gather everyone at the table because it's dinner time. So. It could also mean dinner time. It actually means eat rice. And my mom actually opened up her first chifa in Peru in 1975. Tell us the story of how chifa began when your mother, Wendy, opened it in Lima, Peru. My family decided to immigrate from Hong Kong uh, to Peru. And we had a layover in Los Angeles. And it was my mother, my father, and my two sisters. And my mom was actually pregnant with me. On the way, uh, while they were visiting my uncle in Los Angeles, I was actually born a little early. I was born here in Chinatown, Los Angeles, at um, French Hospital. And two months later, my family decided to continue their journey, move to Peru. 
we set up house and my mom, there's this kind of fundraising that Chinese people do in Peru where everyone kind of supports each other to help open up restaurants. So she decided to be one of those people and opened up her own restaurant. So the name of the restaurant was Chifa Kokwai and the Kokwai is actually my um, Chinese name. And it's very common to name your Chinese restaurant after your firstborn son. You grew up in a household that was food centric and with a mother that was a chef and a restaurateur. How do you think that influenced your direction? There's so many synergies with food and fashion. Do you think, say, the making and creating of the food might have tweaked something within you? On a very deep level, I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Bronwyn, I think that's actually an interesting question. I think it has to do with the continued journey because um, after we opened in Peru for two years, in 1977, my family got a letter saying that we could become citizens in the U.S. And my parents have had to make the choice to give up what they had just started in Peru that was really successful and going well, or move to the United States and hope that um, this could be the right move for their kids and giving their kids the American dream. So they chose the latter and we ended up moving to um, Highland Park in 1977 and went to school between Highland Park and Eagle Rock um, back then. And when my mom moved here, she ended up taking a cafeteria job, just serving food at a cafeteria. So really kind of not behind the kitchen anymore. And as a side job, she also um, sewed for a garment factory, a sweatshop of sorts in the U.S. And she was also sewing garments at home. And in her pastime to you know, make sure I didn't get into trouble, she would have me sew next to her. So I think that's where my initial um, interest in clothing and food came about, is through this early babysitting time. Hmm. Fascinating. So it really is, that is really true fusion. <laughs> and, it, and it really is about craft at the end of the day, isn't it? That is what craft and creativity is what unites these two different disciplines. Yeah, and I think one of the things that my mom always instilled in me is to not cheat through the process um, in cooking, really learning how to make things from scratch, learning about ingredients from you know a whole and seeing them as vegetables and as fruits and as, as ingredients, and then seeing the process of how that gets turned into what we consume. And same for clothing. I think my mom had a knack for making clothing. I mean, she could just watch you come in in a dress and she can completely repattern your dress by sight. <laughs> you know, she, she just knows how to, to create. And um, it's something I'm really envious of. And, and she's actually much better than I am. And, um, <laughs> but I learned a lot of that from her. Interesting. So fast forward to today you decide to restore Chifa. Tell us why. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think fashion is something that I love and it's always going to be a part of my world. But I think if people really dissect it, what I did, what you realize is I was always building a community and a feeling. I made it a really important factor to give people food even at our fashion shows, I had, you know, Magnolia cupcakes come out to one of our Kenza shows. And I remember making fresh cupcakes for everybody at one of our shows. We had Mama Fuku come and make their cookies. And food has always just been a part of, of the process of entertainment and enjoyment and celebration. So it's something that to me has always been a part of our vocabulary. Chifa's interiors are an Instagram sensation. They've been showcased in Vogue and Architectural Digest. Paint a picture of the interiors. It's your vision. Talk us through your mood board and explain your inspirations. 
when I was designing the space, I wanted to transport people because I really designed the furniture first and I wanted the furniture to all have this kind of emerald green feeling. Green is a very lucky color in Chinese culture. So the color was really important. The tables, I wanted it to look like mahjong tiles. Oh, and I fun. found this <laughs> I found this eco-recycled acrylic that's incredible. And they were able to do this marbleization that I was really excited about. And I really wanted everything to have like these kind of soft edges, which is why there's the curves on the table. And there's this big heart theme throughout the whole restaurant. Um, because I, as I was trying to think of a symbol that could be Chifa, all I could thinking about was our family. And I thought I wanted something really obvious that could show that this is a family of love. And we wanted to share that love to our consumers. And then as I was thinking about the space, I could have easily gone and said, let's do a very chic, white walled, simple space. But I really wanted people to walk into something that they wouldn't imagine that they would be in. Mm -hmm. And so I spoke to my friends at Calico Wallpaper and I said, hey, I know you do these collaborations with different artists. Would you ever do something with me? And they were really excited and they were like, oh, that's so cool. I, I love that idea. And so I became their artist of that season. Fun. And I, yeah. And so I designed this, this wallpaper called Heartwood and Heartwood is basically the most dense part of a tree. Yeah, and I really love this kind of, um, this gold bronze color that's in the space. Um, I just wanted there to feel this, this celebration. And I'm really um, inspired by Wong Kar Wai. I mean, his movies move me like no other and visually they're some of the most impactful movies I've ever seen. And Sid Mead, he's one of the most you know, celebrated futurists out there. He designed skylines like for downtown LA that are barely even, they're becoming what they, he drew now. And there's still so much more to, to become of it. And so this kind of juxtaposition between Sid Mead and Wong Kar Wai really kind of gave me some feelings and moods I really wanted the space to evoke. And that's what Chifa became. Tell us about the cuisine. It's based on the concept of fusion, but I believe your brother-in-law has moved it on beyond Cantonese and Peruvian. Tell us how. So my mom, when she opened up her original Chifa, she always said, I want this to be a place, and this is in Peru, I want this to be a place where people visiting from China would come in and say, oh, wow, like this is really authentic Chinese food. And so when we decided to reopen Chifa, um, obviously my family had been cooking Peruvian food quite some time. And like I said, we never fused the cuisine. So it wasn't ever like a Chinese Peruvian fusion. It was Peruvian food in its purity sat alongside Chinese food. So really what we're saying is the cuisine at Chifa is our family meal. It's what you would eat in our home, but now served in a restaurant. That was Umberto Leon, fashion designer turned restaurateur. I'm Bronwyn Cosgrave. Thank you for listening to Rodeo Drive, the podcast. It is presented by the Rodeo Drive Committee with the support of the city of Beverly Hills, the Heyman family, to Rodeo Drive, Geary's and the Beverly Hills Conference and Visitors Bureau. Rodeo Drive, the podcast, is written by Francis Anderton, with editing and audio production by Avishai Artsy. Brian Banks composed the theme music. Livia Manduel, Callie McConnell, and Sula Jenya are the production coordinators. The executive producer is Lynn Winter. Please rate, review, and subscribe to Rodeo Drive, the podcast. Share it with your friends. Join us on Instagram at Rodeo Drive. See you on the street.